ask yourselves, WWJZ do? What would, what would Jay-Z do? Yeah. He'd probably rap about it. He'd rap about it. And he'd rap about it. And then he'd pass the mic to Blake. No, nah, no, nah, I don't want the mic. Give it to Adam. Uh, uh, neither, I uh, don't want the mic either, so uh, I'll pass it back to uh, yours. It's back to me. I don't mind that because I'm a R-A-P-P-E-R. Where's my car? I mean my whip, guys. Where's my whip, guys? Rapping, stopping. I don't want the mic. T-B-T-L. Guess what day it is? Guess what day it is? It's Friday. Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the weekend. My wife's on one of those damn planes these guys are fooling with. That puts me on the playing field. And if you'd have moved your fat feet when I told you to, we wouldn't be hip deep in snow right now. That's right? it. Security, you're out of here. A year ago, this is exactly what Greg Kinnear was doing, but now he has an Oscar for Sliding Doors 3, colon, Jingle All the Door. Poop, booty, scoop, scoop, poop. The story of this situation is, it's extremely personal. Well, all right. Hello, good morning, and welcome, everyone, to a Friday edition of TBTL, the show that just might be too beautiful to live. Oh, it might not be good for the mind, but uh, it's most definitely good for the soul. My name is Luke Burbank. I am your host. Back away, banana breath. What the hell did you just eat, a banana? Coming to you on a beautiful Friday morning. It's Fleet Week in Portland, Oregon. The big ships have moved in. The sunny weather is here, and things are fine and dandy, my friends, here on episode 4,223 in a collector's series. Let the fun begin. Uh, Some kids in Ireland, like tweens, some 12-year-olds in Ireland may have written (laughs) the song of the summer. I'm like seriously excited. I'm kind of shy, but mostly excited. Or at least the song of my summer. You think you can match what we do? I doubt it. It's the opening salvo from these kids from County Cork. I have heard this song in my head for the last four or five days, and now I want to put it into all of your ears so you will only be able to hear these Irish kids for the next three four days that will come up uh, later in the show also time permitting the most famous waterfall in china is apparently (laughs) at its source coming out of a big pipe and it's how dare you it's actually an interesting contrast in cultures they don't seem that mad in china about it about the fact that their most beloved waterfall is just shooting out of a pipe (laughs) that a hiker noticed when he got up to the top of the waterfall i don't know if it'd go over that way here in the good old u.s of a Uh, So we'll get into that. We'll do some music for your weekend. And we're going to talk to this guy, the longest-running Cobro of the show, maybe best known for his depictions of the tall ships. Your voice is like a combination of Fergie and Jesus. He's Andrew Walsh, and he's joining me right now. Good morning, my friend. I'm afraid I lied to you, Luke. I don't Uh even know exactly how or why. I was um, pulling that intro package for the beginning of the show, and I told you there's Mm -hmm. some weird drop in there where somebody's yelling, and I said, I think it's like the TV edit of Die Hard. Some guy railing about his wife being on a plane and ankle deep in snow or something like that. But then I heard, as I listened again just now, I hear I heard a Dennis Franz in there. There's no Dennis Franz or even airplanes in Die Hard, is there? Or snow. Or snow. It's at Nakatomi Plaza in Los Angeles, California. As Bruce Willis famously says, Come to the coast. We'll have a good time. Like the whole thing is unfolding no, in Los Angeles. I don't, I don't there would never that be movie. snow. That's he doesn't say that in Die Hard. I don't. Did you say think, that in something else? I think. I he says rose. He says rosebud. Oh, in Die yeah, Hard. no, you're right. You're right. Wait, do I have this And right? he is sledding. Yeah. There is snow. There is you're absolutely <laughs> right. I think there's snow, and there's an amazing opening shot. Okay. but like, he has to choose. He has to make a very hard choice, right? It's. Some, it's Die Hard's choice. I think terrorists take over the newspaper that he runs. I don't know. I'm okay. all confused now. But I am. Con- I think I will be honest with you. Will you play? Are you spoo- able to play yeah. that drop in isolation? Le- well, I have to search for because I don't know what it is. But here's what I know. Here are the, here are the factors that I know. I will try to talk and okay. Google my machine at the same time. Just over here googling my. Please machine. stop googling your machine okay, during the fair. program, sir. That is fair. I remember this goes back a long time ago, probably when I was when I made that mix years ago. Um, you were out of office, 
I don't know why. I emailed you and said, what's going on on the show today? And I got an out-of-office response. And so I said, we'll get Hannah Brooks Olson to fill in host for you that day. And I know all of this because she and I must have already started our cleaning podcast, Spotless, at that point, because I did a bit with her. I did a quiz with her, I believe, where I, because quote unquote cleaning or cleaned up things are our raison d'etre. Um, I created a quiz of cleaned up lines from movies as they broadcast on TV. So I went on some journey of finding all these like wacky examples of movies right. as they were Famous. cleaned up for broadcast. What were you gonna do? Were you gonna jump in there? <clears throat> oh, you're clearing your throat. Never mind. Sorry. Um, so all of that is to say, and as I'm Googling around here, I think, was Dennis Franz in Die Hard 2? Was Dennis Franz Very in possible. Die- okay, let me do something here. I need to get rid of this music for a second here because I may, may have... Yeah, and I fate. can't remember the plot of Die Hard 2. Die Hard 2 might have been, happened somewhere snowy. Die Hard on a snowy plane? Is that what they called it mm-hmm. here? Let's take a listen to this. They gotta be close. Somebody better get this snow off this mother trucking plane. They gotta be close. I'll have my men tear this airport apart. Okay, I think this is it. I have this labeled it's as Die Hard 2, Bruce Willis edited. And yeah, but I'm hearing- Jingle I'm, all the doors. I am getting some very strong notes of Dennis Franz. They gotta be close. I'll have my men tear this airport apart. Just in the nick of time, huh? Hey, McLean, I got a first class unit here, SWAT team and all. We don't need any Monday morning quarterbacks. Hey, forget Monday morning. My wife saw one of those <laughs> damn planes these guys are fooling with. That puts me on the playing field. And if you'd have moved your fat feet when I told you to, we wouldn't be hip deep in snow right now. That's right? it. Security, you're out of here. So that voice, okay, now is that supposed to be? That's supposed to be Bruce, Bruce Willis. Willis. Yes, yes. How amazing is that? Please, uh, Andrew, yes. could you play that for me one more time? Yes, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to maybe skip ahead a little bit here. Here we go. Nick of time, huh? Hey, McLean, I got a first class unit here. SWAT team no, and all. No, we-, we need to go back because we need to compare and contrast yes. Bruce Willis's voice. I'm just going to play the whole thing. I mean, it's worth it. Oh my Absolutely. gosh, the, somebody swoops in. I mean, you can't really tell where the Bruce Willis begins and ends, can you? They got to be close. I'll have my men tear this airport apart. Just in the nick of time, huh? Hey, McLean, That's I got a first-class unit here, SWAT team and all. We don't need any Monday morning quarterbacks. Hey, forget Monday morning. My wife saw one of those damn planes these guys are fooling with. That puts me on the playing field. <laughs> and if you'd have moved your fat feet when I told you to, we wouldn't be hip deep in snow right now. That's right? it. Security, you're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that guy sounds like they grabbed somebody from Fargo. <laughs> I don't know. How is that the best person within reach? How is I that don't the understand best? it. I swear my... Come out to the coast. Have, that's a better Bruce Willis impression. I should. I, I can't do this on the fly. I should transcribe what that line is, and you and I should see if we can do better Bruce Willis reads oh, of those yes. words. Except, I, I got to say, I don't think I can do a Bruce Willis at all. I mean, I, I can't. I didn't think I could do one either, but now that I know what was passing for a Bruce Willis impersonation. I think that's how Bukowski started writing. I remember that that was something that I read in an interview or something a long, 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 long time ago, and it stuck with me. was like he didn't consider himself a very good writer, but then he was looking at what other people were writing. He's like, well, I can do better than that, or at least as good. So that's, what, that's how your Bruce Willis imitation was born. How would I? Also, I mean, I know Bruce Willis was a... A big action star at the time and very busy and very in demand. But for all the money that they paid him for Die Hard 2, yeah. it did not include him just like stepping into um, a, a recording booth for literally two hours and just just like rip off all of, you know, just quickly read the lines that they knew were going to need to be changed for television broadcasts. Like, Could again, he have I know refused Bruce Willis- because it was so poorly written. Do you think he didn't want his voice attached to that terrible line read? I think there's a certain level of Hollywood stardom where they just don't, mm-hmm. you know, there's a famously there's somebody who who apparently does all of Morgan Freeman's like ADR, all the stuff that needs to get recorded later that they didn't film um, or that they, <clears throat> excuse me, need to change. By the way, apologies for my voice. My allergies are once mm-hmm. again just absolutely um, I'm in uh, some kind of a Zyrtec commercial right now. I'm the guy who didn't take Zyrtec and regrets it. But anyway, um, there's somebody who I've heard like does because, you know, when you make a movie, there's all the stuff that they film and record and the video and audio or the film and audio. But then there's ADR 
uh, which I think is like additional dialogue recording or alternate dialogue recording or something. And there's a lot of that that goes on, too, and it's just part of the movie-making process. But I've heard that there's somebody who does all of Morgan Freeman's stuff because they can just do a dead-on Morgan Freeman impression. Yeah, a lot of people, first of all, you think I am, Mr. Falcon. Yippee ki yay, <laughs> Mr. Falcon. I hear that pop up sometimes in other things as well. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people do a Morgan Freeman, right? That's like kind of a because he has such an iconic, distinctive mm-hmm. voice that I think it's 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 fairly uh, impressionable. You can do an impression mm-hmm. of it, and maybe Bruce Willis is a little bit harder. But I am I'm truly shocked at how much they phoned that in. Like they really could have found someone who sounded a little he. Honestly, sounds like he might be a different ethnicity altogether. <laughs> Just like, like Morgan <laughs> Freeman was born in 1937. This is he narrated his own birth, saying, Leaving the warm comfort of his mother's womb, I, Morgan Freeman, enter the world. Soon I will make my first poop, one of many in the <laughs> life of Morgan Freeman. So that I feel like there was a time when I pulled a lot of Morgan Freeman imitations. Ooh, that really is Morgan Freeman, or someone no, doing that's a Morgan somebody, Freeman? I'm, uh, God, I th- I think that's somebody doing him. I have That is just labeled Morgan Freeman parody. That's from a long time. I ago. believe that what's about to follow is really going to amaze. Now that's really Morgan Freeman, I think, and this is fake Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman was born in 1937. He narrated his own birth. We also have somebody What about Will him. Forte saying, truly was. Because <laughs> that's, that's vaguely a Morgan Free. I think, Is I that think what he's doing? Inspired by, well, I think his tone of voice sounds like he's trying to kind of be, have some sort of gravitas. Mm. That's a little, you know, we associate Morgan Freeman with like the height of gravitas. Yes, I'm tr- looking for that. We also, oh, here, we all, don't we also have him singing the thong song or at least narrating oh, it? Oh, sure, narrating it. Yeah, so yeah. scandalous. And you know, another couldn't handle it. So you're shaking that thing like who's the ish <laughs> with a look in your eye so devilish. Mm. I guess that's all we have of that. And that's not all. That's also a Morgan Freeman impersonator. That's right? just an impersonator. And that clears my file. I, so I, for mm-hmm. people who think that this is going nowhere, we have reached the end of anything that is labeled <laughs> Morgan in my except for Piers Morgan. And we don't need to go into that uh, here. Yeah, let's not put any oxygen into that yes, fire. Right. Um, I wonder now that you're playing that, I'm thinking like. I wonder if the and it's a pretty niche, uh, pretty niche thing as is. But like, I wonder if the day of the celebrity impressionist is coming to an end because of AI, because Hmm. pretty soon, I mean, we've had it happen here. Like the people have made AI versions of us. We've made AI versions of Andy Rooney. It's not quite there. But if it's, you know, if it's following Moore's law, if it's if it's improving sort of exponentially, we'll be able to have an impression of anyone who's ha- ever had their voice recorded and it will probably eventually be almost spot on. You know, I that I I had sort of forgotten about this when I was living in LA, I was like listening to a lot of the Kevin and Bean show, which of course mm-hmm. Bean is a good friend of ours now, um and you've you've known of Bean and the Kevin and Bean show long long before I did, but then when I was living there, I was listening to it a lot and um I was surprised and then eventually delighted that they still did that old school commercial morning show thing where they had somebody who just did impressions and would, you know, mm-hmm. pretend to call him in, call into the show as all kinds of famous people. And and then I would later learn that that is Ralph Garman, who had, I, when I remember first hearing that and being like, this is. Is if only Ralph the... Garman could have done an impression of someone who wanted to read our commercial. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I think you're thinking of somebody else. Ralph Garman has never done a read for us before. You're thinking who of... Did, who did the world's worst TBTL read the most? Um, it's another fella who has a very long-running podcast. Um, Jimmy Never Pardo. Not Funny. Yeah, is J- that Jimmy Pardo's Never Not Funny? Yeah. That's his podcast. Yeah, yeah, that was him. Ralph never Garman Not is... Trying <laughs> to Read. We had, for people that don't know... We we had this brief moment of like having the tiniest bit of traction at our old company where they were trying because they did they make that happen or did we make that happen? No, they made that happen in some way. So we were doing some swap. podcast swaps where we do kind of a, a read. You know, you hear it on this show too. We do ones for other shows that we like, and we had done one for Never Not Funny, and then they were going to do one for us. And when we finally heard the read that this Jimmy Pardo guy did, it was just like <laughs> it was like. They uh, they interrupted a bowel movement he was doing <laughs> to have him read. 
like have and he wanted to get right back to the bowel movement i am looking all I, how did i not save that maybe it hurt my soul too much i can't <laughs> i know that at one point i had that isolated him like clearly reading it cold for the first time i mean which that ice happens cold. There's ice, ice cold there's ice cold there's disinterested and then there's the there's whatever jimmy pardo did two. talking about <laughs> where it somehow the read disincentivized anybody who would have potentially listen to the show i think we lost listeners it was like someone handed him a child's (laughs) finger painting and said read this and then he had to just kind of try to math it out on the fly and he put no effort into it yeah that sounds about right but yeah anyway i just uh the ralph garman thing i just remember at first being like oh man that's so weird that's so old school and like just like you just have your guy call in and pretend to be celebrities but by like the third day i'm just like put it in my veins i thought it was so funny it's the number one thing for me about the howard stern show (laughs) that i absolutely adore is they just and the this is going to be uninteresting to the tbtl listeners but um you know i guess you all are used to it at this point me just talking about the the sort of real nuts and bolts of a totally different broadcast but the 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 thing with stern that's amazing is they've just got like I don't know, five or ten really good impressionists on standby every single minute of the show. And so when the conversation that they're having, which is just going in all different directions, when someone thinks, oh, you know who would be funny weighing in on this? Mitt Romney. (laughs) They get this knock on the door, and it's just Mitt Romney. And the bit with Mitt Romney, first of all, the guy is so, so spot on. Like, you would not know it's not Mitt Romney. But the thing is, he's just a freak in the sheets. <laughs> and so just imagine complete deadpan Mitt Romney, but just describing the crudest, <laughs> the absolute crudest sexual acts. But in that very Mitt, and, and like, and they have, you know, you name it, like they have a, it's not all politics, but they do have a really good Mitch McConnell. They have a doctor now for my 600 pound life. They have a Joan Rivers. They have a guy who does Andrew Dice Clay. Which I, I'm not into Andrew Dice Clay, but I think it's actually a meta joke about how unfunny Andrew Dice Clay is. Because he just calls in and all he wants to talk about are, you know, the kind of gross Andrew Dice Clay sort of jokes. They have, who else do they have? I they feel have, like you might, you really don't think Andrew Dice Clay is not funny? Like, <laughs> do you think it's too nuanced for you? I wonder if you're missing some of the nuance. You know, I should probably go back and re, uh, when I get done rewatching Sophie's Choice. <laughs> I'll go back and, and re-examine. He was very good in that the last Woody Allen movie I could watch with a clear conscience, which what is, you was know. What it? I'm trying to think if I would have. It was, the, it was Blue Jasmine, I think. Okay. It was, oh, it yeah. Was, I saw that. Oh, my God. It was Kate Blanchett. Yeah. You know what, Luke? I saw that in one of our favorite theaters. You and I, I don't think we ever went there together, but I know we both used to love that little theater that was like kind of on the corner of Capitol Hill. On your way out of Capitol Hill towards Montlake, where those three uh-huh. streets um, kind of come together, there was that great The Harvard old th- Exit? The Harvard Exit. I believe I watched that matinee by myself up in the um, balcony. I watched that movie. The Harvard Exit was my safety school. <laughs> in that I was just going to go watch movies oh, wait, there if I what? didn't get into college. You call, I actually went to Tufts Exit. I, uh, <laughs> I was trying to I went to a movie CV in Boston, <laughs> Andrew, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we must have listeners who went to Tufts. I'm sorry. It's just a go-to. Tufts is a great school. It's a great. Um, I couldn't get into Tufts, obviously. I think I think that uh, that joke goes back to Seinfeld or something. I don't know why I always put in Tufts. There. Was there somebody who was saying they went to school in Boston so that it would seem like Harvard, but in fact they went to Tufts? I feel I feel like Elaine Bennis That's, might have shouted at one point, Tufts was my safety school, but I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not entirely sure of that. But back to these impressions on the Stern show, they're so good and also so bizarre. They have one, they have a Rosie O'Donnell who is, uh, I, I'm, by the way, there is a theme emerging here, which is somehow it all comes back to sex, but there's a Rosie O'Donnell who is sexually aroused by bad news related to Donald Trump. Mm hmm. Because she famously has feuded with him. Sure. And so any this was their response to the Trump guilty verdict. Well, first of all, they were on vacation for like two weeks because they take a lot of time off on that show. And then they finally come back and the, literally within the first three minutes, they're like, yeah, you know, Trump guilty on 34 counts. Knock, knock, knock. Oh, it's Rosie O'Donnell. And she is enjoying herself, let's say. And they're playing. They're just literally playing like MSNBC coverage of the guilty verdicts as she's sort of like having a time. These these don't sound very interesting or nuanced as I describe them, but the old school impression, when it's a good impression, 
And also, this is why they will not, these people will never be replaced by AI because what's particularly great about the Stern Show impressionists is they can also improv. So it's not mm -hmm. just because yeah. you, you, know, you have people that can do a, a, a Donald Trump impression, but can they can they extemporate or can they freelance in the person of this character that they're doing an impression of as Howard Stern is talking to them, asking them questions, you know, throwing them curveballs. And all of the people that do the impressions on that show can also do that. And that's what really raises it to the next level. Yeah, right. What was the name of our boy? He had three names. He was always doing the Trump impressions. Then he ended up going to SNL, right? Um, James Austin Johnson, I think his yeah. name was. Is he still on SNL? I just had a very weird thought. He's their Trump. This is very strange. I wonder if he... This is not... This is so not interesting. But for a while there, I was getting so much James Austin Johnson in my life because I followed him on Instagram. I think that was before he joined SNL and we knew him from the viral videos that he was releasing, right? And they had yeah. kind of gotten uh, caught in a kind of an, an upswell online. And so we were obsessed with that for a while. And I felt like he was a very avid like uh, Instagrammer. You, ever, you, you must have people like that, not even in your life, that you've never met before, celebrities or whatnot, who live a lot larger in your life than they should only because they're prolific on one of your on one of your platforms like for me it's Instagram uh -huh. I mentioned like Ego Nuodum I've never seen I mean I've seen her maybe in the occasional sketch on SNL uh, on YouTube or something but for the most part I only follow her because I heard her on um, Comedy Bang Bang once and now she's like one of the only people on the cast that I can that I can name and it has nothing to do with SNL it's just because I randomly followed her one time I was the and same because way you let you probably let one of the you know if she put a video up you might let it run and then the algorithm is like okay he wants more ego well, nuotum content that's a little bit more of a tiktok -y thing i don't play in the it doesn't happen story. with instagram the same way i think i think you can use instagram in a way that that is the case but that is not the case for me for the most part mm -hmm. i don't get randomized stuff in fact every couple of months it starts giving me randomized stuff and i have to say no turn this off for another 60 days or something like that like I just like to follow who I follow that's one of the things that I don't kind of love about um, was that your computer or mine did you hear that I did not then that was my computer what what, what was that the call was is very, coming from inside the basement it was a very calming sound but I got to get to the bottom of that because we don't want that but um, uh, yeah there are just certain people so anyway I just follow who I follow I don't like randomized stuff I like to that that was kind of one of the things that changed on Twitter too. Twitter and Instagram at some point just started saying we need to keep these I don't it just feels like they're force feeding us like I'm some sort of uh -huh. some sort of social media foie gras which is a really dark thing to say but like they're just like oh no you have to see this the algorithm thinks you're gonna like this and I just like I really I really cringe at that I really kind of like so I'm always constantly just trying to follow who I follow and because of that like Anthony Bourdain was a good example too before he passed away like I never watched any of his shows they used to be on in the radio station with the sound down during my night mm -hmm. show on Friday so I feel like I would be staring at him being in very beautiful places in the world eating great food but I never heard the show I didn't watch it I wasn't necessarily a fan I just signed up for his Instagram feed and then because of that I felt like we were best friends actually after a year. Mm -hmm. Anyway, on the subject of James Austin Johnson, I have to say, I like you used to love his Trump impression. Would he just be like wandering around yeah. LA? Yeah. And he's just like, he's just his normal self doing this like really funny improv Trump thing that's unhinged the way the real Trump is, but also about these things that Trump actually probably wouldn't talk about, you know? And there was something that was really fun about it. I don't really love the version of him. On mm. SNL, where they have him in a like a kind of a Donald Trump suit, they you know they add some weight to him. They do the hair. They're trying to make him physically look as much like Trump as possible. And the thing about it that I find unsettling is I feel it normalizes Trump in some way mm. because it makes him not what he really is, which is a threat to democracy, but just kind of like your loony uncle mm -hmm. who says loony things, but you know you gotta love him kind of a thing. And I don't think that's like what James Austin Johnson is trying to do. I don't think that, that that's his goal, but that feel like it's what's happening because I, I thought his Trump impression was so great. And then he went on SNL and I was like, oh, cool. Well, now they have a really good Trump impersonator. But but the few sketches I've seen where they trot him out as Trump, the few cold opens, again, I feel that it really just makes Trump seem less threatening and more just kind of batty. Like, oh, that's just Trump being Trump. And I don't like that effect. Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I have stuff to say. I just don't think we want. I, the only thing I ha have to say there takes it to a not fun place. We move further and further away from the um, Ralph Garmans and um, and and uh, Howard Stearns and get more into the NPRs, which is just sort of like I mean that is that is the that that's the tough nut to crack, right? I mean, specifically for journalists, I think, but also, I guess, as you're describing a version of this on SNL, where, you know, I think most of our listeners would know that a couple of months ago, there was like kind of a lot of like news coming out of NPR, but not the kind of news that they want, not them just doing journalism, but, you know, the editor, Uri Berliner, they're sort of like kind of publicly stating that NPR has lost its sort of, um, sort of lost its way as far as representing all sides or both sides of, of you know stories and specifically politics and I sort of feel like well that is what like organizations like that that are trying to they're trying to keep a foot in reality and also present all sides but not normalize something that is definitely not normal right and that's mm -hmm. kind of always been the problem with Trump is like we don't know how to we don't know how to especially I guess as kind of media people that are maybe trying to not be biased because that is an SNL thing, right? Like SNL in a certain way, I feel like back in the seventies, they were just like the liberal weirdos, but like in the nineties, they kind of became like, you know, we'll have, well, Giuliani was a New York guy. So that makes more well, they sense. Had Trump like, host, they had he Trump host. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. political at the time, I guess. But I guess they just sort of like, yeah. And those are both, I guess, kind of New York stories, but generally speaking, like I think SNL also kind of, doesn't want to be just, they they're trying to speak to middle america as much as mm -hmm. as much as the coasts yeah yeah i mean um well let me you know what i'll respond the uh, like my friend andrew does sometimes yeah yeah <laughs> that's why it's just I, a bad it's just bad <laughs> yeah it's just bad all around and i should yeah, have left like, it at yeah actually <laughs> can i can i actually can i get i took us on this train i don't want to cut you off but if you're as uncomfortable as i am kind of getting into this world on a friday let me bring it back to stern for a second because i is one of my favorite topics as i've mentioned that's why i thought you'd be okay with me steering it back to that um one of the things that you've mentioned recently as you've been listening to a lot of Stern and is sort of popping up on the show is your complaint that, like, he just takes so much vacation. They don't have that much new content. When they release shows, they're long and, and, yeah. and you enjoy them, but then they'll just go dark for so long. Well, um, I don't think I mentioned this on the show, Luke, but I've been enjoying a free subscription to Sirius Satellite Radio the past couple of months. And this time I've been kind of listening to a lot of various things, but not so much Stern. And the other day I was at the gym and I was like, oh, this would be the perfect time for me to dip into some Stern. Maybe Luke and I can even talk about it on the show. Like, what's up with this guy? So I go to the app and I play what looks like the latest episode. I'm like, oh, oh man, forget it. they haven't posted anything in like a couple of weeks. But I was on the full episode. I wasn't looking for clips. Okay. I went, I, so I did find a full episode. And so I went to the full episode tab and I'm like, I guess I'll play what the latest one was. And it looked like it was a couple of weeks ago. And I'm playing, I'm listening to it. And, you know, it's okay. In the back of my head, I'm like, oh, they're talking about sports. They're talking about like the basketball playoffs. And I know that this is outdated. I kind of don't like that. I like listening to like that type of programming. I like it to be a little bit more up to date, but I'm like, okay, this is fine until we're like 15 minutes into it. And I realize, oh, it's all leading up to his controversial comments that we did discuss on TBTL about how he had a theory about how the players don't oh, go yeah. up to him when he's at well, the he, games because or the black players don't because they don't yeah, like him thinks, as much because he's white. I mean, what's funny about that, I, I can't believe this is really the show today, but I am so here for it. I love like when Phyllis and I get together and just talk about Stern. It's like one of my happiest places. Um, he every so the Knicks come up on the show a lot because well they were you know progressing through the playoffs and everybody there is fans and including Stern. And literally every time the Knicks come up, he can't avoid he can't hold back on the his theory that none of the players say hi to him when he's at the games mm -hmm. because they're black and he's white. And you can just hear in Robin Quivers' voice, Robin who's a black woman, you can hear her just. <laughs> just die inside a little bit because of how unhinged this theory is. And like he, so I'm unsurprised. Like if, if you ever see, like if there was meta, if there was a word cloud around a stern episode and you saw Nick's, you could also assume that he, in that moment, in the way that there are the things that we always bring up when certain topics come up, the listeners know that like if X comes up, then Luke will say Y or whatever. Like with him, it's if the Knicks come up, he will go on this thing about how the players don't say hi to him. He thinks because they're black and he's white, which is 
absolutely ludicrous. First of all, if X comes up, Luke will say, formerly known as Twitter. Um, <laughs> no, but wait, you're adding some clarification because the reason I bring this up is, and I, you know, I think you and I consume this kind of media in in similar fashions. We like it sort of. We we like the full show. We don't want clips. Like we'll take the good with the bad on that. Like just go on the journey and also have it be sort of up to date. I don't want this super curated. Curated. I don't like to listen to like greatest hits radio shows, best of radio shows it's just like well no those shows were good in the moment anyway when I started listening to this and it looked like it was an episode from a couple of weeks ago and then I heard him mention this thing again I was like oh this was a repeat a couple of weeks ago and this is like the show where he said the thing and I turned it off but it turns out you're saying oh yeah he just says that all the time this probably really was from a couple of weeks ago oh okay every single and in fact when the Knicks have played or like back when they were still, they're eliminated now, but when they were playing and there would be a big game and I knew there was going to be a Stern show, I would, I would wince because I was like, the Knicks are going to, I'm sure that the listeners have some version of this with our show, many versions of this maybe, but I would wince because I would think uh, the Knicks are going to come up on the show tomorrow and then Howard's going to say that thing. <laughs> that just, uh, everyone just goes quiet uh-huh. because there's just no, first of all, there's just, there's absolutely no, no um, sort of uh, logic to it. It's it's untrue and and it's frankly pretty racist, <laughs> and, yeah. and and but but everybody just kind of just like everybody just goes quiet and hopes he gets through this quickly and they can get on to other things. Yeah. But, uh, so yeah, you heard him just talking about great, it. Yeah. So it wasn't literally a greatest hits. It's just no. like Howard. That's like his him playing the hits. What he says. Now let me tell you one thing that he his also- other big one is that he anytime his experience of growing up comes up, he talks about how. He, he, he went to a high school that I guess we, you know, if we believe him was predominantly African-American and he felt like he was sort of bullied there or was, you know, people would give him a hard time because he was a white kid in a predominantly black school and like. And a he, Jewish he, kid, right? Isn't that kind of yeah. something that he talks about a lot? Um, no, I don't maybe think not. He, okay. He don't really chalk it up to anti-Semitism. Okay. That I've noticed, but he just like I guess I didn't mean anti semitism I, mean, I could be totally wrong. For some reason, I thought maybe in his like maybe when he had that uh, bio- biographical movie come out or something, I thought that was kind of a bigger part of his growing up was that he was a fish out of water as a Jewish kid. But I guess I'm wrong about that. You know, I haven't seen, believe it or not, you I haven't know, seen no, Private no, Parts okay. in a long yeah. time, so yeah. it might get played up in the movie. But as far as like the his go to on his high school years, it's that he was getting his ass kicked at school all the time, mm. and that it was very and and again, it's like. And, and that, you know, his all the, the thing, the thing about all these stories is they also kind of don't line up because later on you find out that like when his, his, his father passed away, he left, he had a considerable amount of money apparently that like, so you'll always talk about how broke they were growing up or how they grew up really poor, but that it's like, actually his dad had been saving a ton of money and, and like, I know it's like this. And, and so it's like, were you really living in an area where you were under this much threat? Like, it's just hard to, it's hard to separate fact from fiction sometimes. Yeah. And when it gets with, with Howard Stern, when it gets racial, it gets really weird, really fast. And he sounds <laughs> All of his 71 years. Yeah, that's you know, the thing, like, too. Yeah, it's racial, and it's also so generational. Like, you think those yes. players give a crap who Howard Stern is. Like, that's that's not about race, my boy. And that's about where well, we are as a society. You want to throw, throw one more little lanyap of weirdness. There's a player on the Knicks who appears white, but is, in fact, biracial. Oh, yeah, and, he brought this up. And Stern up. keeps talking about... This well, that guy should like me because he's white, and the guy's not even white technically. Uh, he brought that up. So again, but again, <laughs> these are things that he just keeps bringing up over and over. It wasn't Hartenstein that, or oh whatever. Oh my god. Okay, but I will say this. So to turn away from that fraught topic for a second. In fairness, though, the Portland Trailblazers do not like me because I'm white, <laughs> no, and because I root against them actively because I'm a Sonics fan. <laughs> that is true. Oh, actually, somebody sent in what they claim is a sharp shot, but it just sort of confused me. I want to ask you about it here in a second, but I do okay. want to say. Um, you know, when we talk about Stern, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are listening who just like do not understand yeah. what you would like about the Stern show or whatever, especially when it gets into kind of the raunchy Particularly stuff. when it's as fraught as it is. The, well, fraught and then also the, the sort of raunchy stuff or whatever. But like I will say that whenever I listen 
Um, even that one, I shut that off after about 15 minutes because I thought, oh, this was from months ago when he made headlines for saying this wackadoo thing. Um, but even in that 15 minutes, he will almost always, if I, if I start listening at the beginning of the show when it's just the banter, I know that's your favorite part too, there's always something that sticks with me. And like, I mean, sticks with me. Mm. I remember one of the first episodes I listened to as like, you know, in the past several years when I kind of revisited the show, him coming back from break, surprise, surprise, and talking about losing a cat, I think. I don't remember the yeah. details of it right now. It was it was incredibly gripping, and I felt for him. Um, and this time he was just talking. It was just kind of a throwaway thing that he mentions. But he mentioned he was watching the Knicks game, and he's like, I can't stand. He's like, I don't like sports. I don't want it to be close. He's like, if I'm going to sit down to watch the game, I just want it to be a blowout. I don't like the games. I just like winning. And he says, same thing when I play chess. You know, I go mm -hmm. online, and I'll play chess against. I don't know if this is, again, something that he says a lot, Luke. So maybe you're you're nodding in agreement because you've heard that you've heard him say this a million times but I found it fascinating when he says when I go online and play chess like you're supposed to choose a level that is you know represents your skill set he's like I always play like the lowest level and I just destroy the opponents <laughs> and he's not talking about playing against a computer he's talking about playing against real people in online yeah. chess matches he's like I don't and he's like I don't I just don't I don't want to play I want to win and I just found that to be so fascinating and then I came home and I put my baseball game on the easiest level it just smoked <laughs> the Yankees got like Very 35 relatable. hits and 22 runs or something it was great I, I will say for the listeners, and I'm sorry that the last 20 to 30 minutes have been especially kind of probably inaccessible to many of you. I want you to know that I hear you and I see you as TBTL listeners because when when people say, well, what are you into? And I say the Howard Stern show for the majority of people I say that to the look of confusion that crosses their face. And then I'm trying to explain, well, I, it's not all like strippers anymore. It's, you know, sometimes it's Rosie O'Donnell having at herself, you know, it's not. It's not. A, I try to explain it. It makes no sense. And then I just basically change the topic. That's got to be what it's like trying to explain TBTL to people. Like, what is this thing yeah. that you listen to 10 hours a week sometimes and and donate money to? And you're flying where to go see what? And then you try to explain this. And then people are like, they just kind of glaze over. I want the listeners to know that I know that feeling because that's what happens when I try to explain my love of the Howard Stern show to the average American. Although we, at least in this case, have the benefit of not also having a reputation. You know what I mean? If I say, sometimes I say to people, like people are like, well, what is your podcast about? And I'll kind of try to explain that it's not about anything. And then at some point I might say, you know, it's kind of like the Stern show isn't about anything. You know, it's just a show. But if you say that, you know, most people who don't listen to the Stern show, what do they think of? They think of the raunchiest stuff. They think of the strippers in the studio when it was a TV show. You think of early mm -hmm. Stern. And, you know, he courted that. Like, and that's not, yeah. that's not erroneous. But, uh, but the show's been around for how long now? 35, 30 years, 35 years? I, I'm bad I don't at that. A long time. Long damn time. So it obviously it, it evolves as well. Not that they've totally, from your and Phyllis's description, it sounds like um, they haven't fully stepped away from this. Well, sexual that's the content. thing. I, I think for a while, I I was trying to do this sort of like a reputational repair on that guy. And now I'm just done doing that because it's honestly not really true. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. I was going around going, well, he's, he, you know, he's, he's not like the guy that was throwing, you know, lunch meat at a, a, a semi clad woman in the studio anymore. Now he's like, you know, well, he did interview Biden by the way. Oh yeah. I heard like, somebody mention his, that. I mean, his politics I think are, are generally in the right place. And I think, I don't know who can look into a man's heart. I think generally his his heart is in the right place, but he still I mean, it is still so problematic and it still often reverts to just like the crudest sexual stuff. Like, right. It's it's still it's a version of the show that everyone thinks it is. It's just there's still there's parts of, you know, there will be things like did is Benji lying about the fact that he recently ran into Woody Allen in New York and Woody Allen said Benji which is an inside joke on the show does Woody Allen the disgraced director know who Benji Bronk is no this was no way, hours right? of entertainment hours of entertainment on the show <laughs> and I was good. so there for it like, that does sound good like that's what I love about and then if and Benji if you're lying and then Michael Rappaport calls in <laughs> the real Michael Rappaport Oh, yeah, Michael oh, yeah. Rappaport is a it's so great the kayfabe so Michael Rappaport the actor Is involved in this fantasy football league that all the producers play in and he Is clearly figured out that his role on the show on the Stern show is just to be 
like the villain mm-hmm. in everything. He calls and leaves these massively unhinged voicemails about fantasy football and about all the things he's going to do to the other producers of Stern when he beats them in fantasy football. It's I mean, it's just like the the, the layers of that show and the different levels of things going on is um, it's impressive. I wish we could do that. I wish we had more. I mean, I don't wish we could have more crude sexual content, mm-hmm. but I wish we if we could have like 20 people work on this show and have all these plot lines related to everyone's lives and, you know, it would certainly take some of the pressure off of us. The problem is I'm out of experiences. It's just the two of us. <laughs> well, I don't have we, anything left in the tank. We always have people that, in fact, yeah, we'll have this conversation off air because we we always have people that we say, oh, yeah, we, we should get you on the show. And we even had somebody lined up, just like a friend of the show a while back, and then she had something pop up at the last minute. And then I just never followed up again. It can be a little tricky, like trying to find a good day yeah. when you and I are both in the same place. And then we can court. It's kind of hard to now I'm just putting it on you, but it's kind of hard to book people when your schedule kind of changes a lot. So thanks for ruining TBTL, Luke, is what I'm saying there. But uh, no, we shouldn't make it. We always say that, but we should make more of an effort because we have so many interesting people in the audience and in our friend group yeah. and everything. And we could we could do more of that. I want to change the subject um, here very briefly before we get to uh, dazzling donors. Only because I, I mentioned this. And I want to clear something up or possibly muddy the waters. Uh, <laughs> one so, of the two things. One happening. of the two things is definitely going to happen. You were talking about having some hometown pride when you were in Portland. Uh, and I, I saw the Shortcrest Scots marching band. You saw the short, and they were, and they're from Seattle, and that's why you yes. felt like a sense of pride. You're like, look, here in Portland, they are representing Seattle. I don't know what you said, but we got this note from a listener named Bill. And not Bill in Canada. This is somebody else. Um, And it says, how dare. Mm. No, it doesn't say that. It says, you guys have probably been sharp shot on this 100 times already. We haven't. This Uh is the only email we got. But Shorecrest is in Shoreline. We have three high schools that I'm aware of anyway. Shorecrest, Shorewood, and Kings. What did you say? I don't remember you saying anything that would fly in the face of that. I mean, I look, Bill. (laughs) It's barely How over. Dare. <laughs> it is barely past 145th, okay, which is the demarcation in my mind. Oh, of did Seattle. you say it Seattle is, and Bill's I probably just called like, it oh, Seattle. I it's see. technically Shoreline. It's like 100 feet into Shoreline. Mm. So simmer down, Stu. No, I love that. The, okay, I didn't know. I thought maybe you said it was in a town called Shorecrest or something. Like maybe you misspoke. The fact, no, I love people in Shoreline speaking up and saying, <laughs> Correcting don't, me. Seattle, do not, no, just like Shoreline pride, sort of, just being like, Seattle, you cannot claim Shorecrest. Shorecrest is ours here in Shoreline. I Listen, there's enough this is how love works, Andrew. Mm-hmm. It's not there's not a finite amount of it. There's it can grow. There's enough for everyone. The more we love the Shortcrest Scots, the more of the Shortcrest Scots there are. Exactly. It doesn't have to be only for people. It's an expansive experience, not a contracting experience. I so agree. I was just feeling very proud of this thing that was from, let's say, the greater Seattle area, the shoreline area, mm-hmm. which also the argument could be made that I was culturally shoreline growing up because I, the Jesus Creek, the school I went to, was in Northgate, but it was very close to shoreline, which is where many of the kids that I hung out with lived, and many of the places we would go were in shoreline. We spent a lot of time there. And then in my adulthood, I voluntarily spent hours and hours and hours of my life at some of the finest casinos <laughs> along Aurora in shoreline, Goldie's, Parker's. Um, the drift on in. Now so Aurora I feel very. Co- I f- I feel very connected to Shoreline. But um, okay, Bill, my bad. It's not a Seattle thing. It's a Shoreline thing. But I still felt very proud of the Shorecrest Scots. The other thing that was funny was, I didn't realize how much they were leaning in to the Scottish vibe, mm-hmm. because that's their you know their their mascot. Like this this marching band, which again was very good. They had, if I remember right. They had the whole band, and everybody's in, like, kilts, and so then they had Scottish dancers that were doing some legit Scottish dancing. They had um, bagpipes. Like, they were... And I and what I realized was, I guess we don't think of Scottish culture as something that it, we're worried about appropriation. We have decided that that's not a big deal, and I'm, I'm personally fine with that. But I was thinking, if, if these were the Shortcrest Braves, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And you had a bunch of people yeah. in, in like Native American garb. It would be weird. But we, we have decided that there is not anything cultural about like the Scottish vibe that that needs to be protected or assigned only to people who happen to be Scottish. It, all people can participate in that, which, again, I welcome. I think it's cool. But it was I just didn't realize how hard they were going on the Scottishness. Would you think it's fair to say that I am culturally Mount Lake Terrace? No. No. I'm no, I mean, have you been to Mount Lake Terrace? No, is it all fancy? No, I mean, I think it's there's probably all kinds of different parts. Mm-hmm. I just, if if you've been going to Mount Lake Terrace and not telling me about it, this is I'm just trying be a to figure problem. out what I am culturally because I mean, I'm, I'm you I think know, you're culturally. Let me. Uh, this I, is a great I'm question. A culturally, Seattle. I think right. You're, you're well, actually, I think you're culturally Greenwood. Really, I don't consider myself yeah. culturally Greenwood. Well, the reason wow. is because you're it's like you're looking in a mirror. Yeah, I think I think you the reason I think you're culturally Greenwood is because you are somewhere in between. You're not as bougie as I am or as I sometimes can become. But you're also, you know, you you have a lovely home that you and Genevieve uh, purchased and take really great care of. You're kind of like right in the sweet spot of like of sort of like you like your good dive bar, but you also like a good meal sometimes. And you like a neighborhood that's walkable, but also you don't mind stepping over a few things on the sidewalk that may or may not be infected. Um, and I feel like that's kind of Greenwood's vibe. Like, I feel like, you know, um, I don't see you as culturally Laurelhurst, but I don't see you as culturally. And I can't name the other neighborhood because then I'm saying whatever, whatever the mm. opposite is, I'm saying that's a trash neighborhood. And I don't mm. think you're oh, I see. that either. I think. I think you're kind of right in the middle, which is how I think of Greenwood in, a, in the best way. Um, I will take that. And what I'm also trying to take here is a little bit of self-control because there is <laughs> – you mentioned dive bars. And there is a dive bar that I go to that is sort of on the cusp between my neighborhood and Greenwood. And you know what it is, Luke. You're the one who kind of tipped me to it. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but you saw it on a map. I'm not going to say the name of it because it's kind of my mm-hmm. go-to place now, but it's definitely – it's definitely more of a dive bar than Teddy's. I always get a little, I always get a little itchy when people refer to Teddy's as a dive bar because I'm like, it's just a bar. A bar. It's not fancy, yeah. but it's just a bar. This place that I'm talking about, you know, I was going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you the story. I'm going to tell it to you really quickly. This place that I go to from time to time is not super convenient for me, but probably the most convenient place if I'm just going to if I'm on a walk. And I was on a long walk the other day, and I was like, you know what? I'm getting a little thirsty for, a, for like a Coors Light. It's out of my way, but I'm going to walk up to this bar. And so I extend my walk by maybe 20 minutes or whatever. I go to this bar. Now, the thing about this bar is it it, it has a pretty – I don't think I would want to go there with you. I think you'd be pretty off-put. I think this has gotten worse lately where it's got a very strong, like, fake fake aroma of something that seems like they're covering <laughs> up something you know what i mean like a strong like a urinal cake isn't the isn't quite it but like that direction you know what i mean uh-huh. like a, a pretty strong some kind of urinal cakey smell that sometimes hey, google what covers the smell of human decomposition? <laughs> yeah, right. It, and like uh, Vives and I went in there once. Like I've always noticed it a little bit, and it definitely is concentrated in the men's room where you can really tell that it is covering up something in there. And then sometimes you go in the bar, and the whole bar kind of smells like it. Vives and I one time went in there, and we were just like, oof, and we kind of got out of there relatively quickly. Um, other times it, it settles into the background nicely. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I'm also so anyway, I do like this place. I really like the bartenders. Um, oh, God. Yeah. One time I was sitting there with Genevieve and some guy. I was looking at the TV above his head and he was all messed up. And he, mm-hmm. I heard him start saying to me, he was like, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? And I told the bartender about this later. Um, I just went into full like, oh, I, I, I didn't even make eye contact with him. I could hear him. And I think mm-hmm. he was really messed up and he was looking for a fight. And I found out Oof. later that he had been looking for a fight. And I just I have some sort of self-preservation thing that is much like a mole in nature, I believe. <laughs> I just locked onto that TV screen. I didn't look away. I didn't give any indication that I heard him. And I heard his brother say, calm down, dude. I think he's just looking at the TV or something. But then I heard him like keep on mumbling. Then he kind of brushed past me later. And then I told Genevieve in the bartender about it later and they had no idea it was going on and I was like I'm telling you guys this was going on she's like yeah he was itching for a fight this whole time I was like yeah but I am like just like I just 
I just like slipped into nothingness. I just, you guys didn't see it, but I just made myself disappear <laughs> in front of everybody's <laughs> eyes. And I'm here the to tell you. Eline has story. taught you much. <laughs> exactly. Okay, that's not the story. The story is I go in there the other day on the, on the sort of uh, spur of the moment. I'm like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a beer. So I go in and the smell is, I don't know about what it usually is. <laughs> and I sit down at the bar. And then I go into the bathroom, and the bathroom, again, is kind of nasty. It always is. There's like one urinal and then one stall. And it is a stall where you can close the door and everything, but I would certainly never use it. And I go in the bathroom, and it does kind of smell, and it's both a combination of something not right and then something trying to make it right. And um, and I, I use the urinal, and then as I'm walking away, somebody's leaving. No, no. It's right as I walk in. Some guy's kind of leaving the stall and he sort of is mm -hmm. kind of like ducking out of the stall a little bit. I'm like, oh, hey, sorry, man, uh, whatever. And I think he washes his hands. I'm not even 100 percent sure of that. Um, and uh, and I use the urinal and then I realize as I'm as I'm washing my hands. Oh, I do remember he washed his hands. But anyway, I, I realize there's a sign on the stall that says this is out of order. Poop at home. And Ooh. I look in there and I see Ooh. that this fella has just ignored the sign and just used it anyway, which is why I think he looked sheepish as he was leaving the restroom. And then I go back to where I would left my like jacket or bag or whatever, and I realize he's sitting basically next to me at the bar. <laughs> there's like a couple of Whoa. there's like a couple of chairs between us. And by the way, he is not a fella who looks like super down and out. He looked like he was reading kind of a fancy cookbook or something like that at the bar. <laughs> um, you know, he did not. He didn't look like somebody again who was, was like kind of down and out. He was cooking up trouble for that. And the per person who works at the bar who has to yes. deal with that. If that toilet doesn't flush, then what is that person going to do? Dude, I kept thinking about it the whole time. I was like taking glances at him and I was just kind of like, you know that meme where there's somebody stand. It's like a very simple like hand drawn meme and it's like a bunch of people to party and there's one person in the corner and it says they don't know that. And then the meme is you fill it in like it might. No, be like, I don't know. OK, that well, I'm not going to I'm not going to extend that any further because it's too hard to explain. I think that some people will know what I'm talking about, but like. The whole time I'm just sitting at the bar just thinking like they don't know that I know yeah. that this guy just pooped in a toilet that literally says don't poop here poop at home and I looked over and there was poop in the toilet and now oh he's just sitting God. at the bar. I do remember now specifically that he washed his hands because they have a new um, I haven't seen one of these since 1984 a new uh, like towel loop to wash your hands and you know those old uh, machines oh, wow. with yeah, the, the like cloth. Aramark. Yeah, you just like pull the new fresh part of it and then eventually like, yes. replay, like those things that were I think those are outlawed in many <laughs> states. <laughs> I think so. But that's the new one. They've added that in the past like five months or so. So I remember that guy using that thing because I remember watching him and thinking like, oh good, it's not busted today, because sometimes it's busted. <laughs> so anyway, I'm I'm thinking like, okay, well he's washed his hands, but there was something that's so dirty about it sitting next to the bar at the at the next to the mad pooper and i was just thinking like, I, mean, I feel bad for the bartenders here absolutely like they're dead and they don't even know it. exactly <sighs> i you couldn't i mean just based on your description of the bar you couldn't pay me enough to poop at this place if everything yeah. was working yeah you know what i mean like exactly this we used to say this about the mandarin gate um or we used to go a lot i mean it was the stuff of nightmares if you if you unfortunately had to go number two while you were there i mean you that would be oh, a night gate. ender like oh, i'm just God. going home yes yes and like you know what i mean like like the idea that this person was able to go it was able to disregard the sign and just go in that toilet is just shocking to me like that i i if you you know, put a gun to my head i couldn't have pulled that off just out of sort of personal comfort exactly and and i would say that like if i were in if I were in that position, like some sort of emergency comes on, it's kind of like, oh, my God, I I have to do this here. Like, you know, I will just face all of my demons and I have to do this here. I'm not sticking around for a couple more rounds. I'm going well, to take a shower. Well, that's the other part. I mean, and I, yeah, I am. Well, you know, they say that they, uh, you know, they always return to the scene of the crime. Mm -hmm. There's like a suspicious fire and then there's a guy standing across the street going, what happened? It's like he's probably mm -hmm. the guy that lit it. Yeah, right. He's wearing an old crusty fireman's hat. It's like really <laughs> You need <dirty>. some help? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm wow, sorry. That's... I've gone on a bunch of different tangents and we're almost an hour into this show. So sorry. We was hoping for some razzle dazzle. Razzle dazzle. That's right, man. Razzle dazzle. On your mark. 
mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody razzle, dazzle. Everybody All right, let's thank some dazzling donors who are dazzling us with their donation of dough. They're keeping this. We ain't the Howard Stern show. Mm-mm. We don't have that serious XM money. So we've got to hit up people like Michelle McNelly, a.k.a. Michelle McNelly ah. of Edina, Minnesota. I think we did it right. Did I? Edina? Nervous. Now I'm in my head about me too. It. But I know I got Michelle right. At exactly. Least that That's right. 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 Michelle. Part. We've changed uh, the course of people's lives. We Michelle really Michelle is now Michelle, former the artist formerly known as Michelle mm-hmm. is now officially Michelle. Because and of it's a very typo. apropos that Michelle is from Minnesota, where the artist formerly known as Prince oh, is from. Good call. Uh, Michelle says, "I too am grateful for TBTL Independence and the loving tens, elevens, and fives. This year, I met up with tens in real life, despite not being able to get to the four thousandth oh. show. Sadly, I am not." Clever like other tens, but I do well, Michelle. Don't sell yourself yeah, what short. Are you there? Uh, but I have two requests: more pet talk, uh, going generic, so Benny and Pooches do not get their feelings hurt. Hmm. Is that? Let's see. Uh, who are uh, Benny and Pooches? Is that a reference to one of Sklarov's dogs? Do I have a Benny? think so. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's what we're. Yeah, Benny. Okay. Yeah. So more pet talk. All right. Oh, mm. uh, we can do that. I, there's nothing you like to talk about more than bingo. Well, I like to talk about mad poopers at dive bars. That's Honestly, no Andrew, problem. that's a good story. I think we should have started with that instead of me talking about Stern impressions. That's, a, <laughs> I don't know. that's I how mean, we got to there. To me, though. that's page one. Yeah. That's above the fold. That's like I went into a dive bar. The toilet was broken. I caught a guy coming out of the stall. He dropped a deuce and get this. He stuck around for the rest of the eve. Yeah. That's a story, my friend. And the funny thing is, like, I remember, I remember as I'm like kind of taking this all in thinking I got to tell you about that but that happened at least that was like at least a week I think like two weeks ago um and it's kind of funny how yeah I should have come in the next day hot with that story but I think they're better when I have to sit on them for a while I feel like well, my story sort with of, I sit with it and so that one had been sort of ruminating and you just conjured it up somehow my my move on that is to tell the story in multiple places and then it slowly gets better. So like last <laughs> night when I was at Livewire, I told the story of being at the Pendleton jail and being followed by the guard. Oh yeah. But like, for instance, I was able to remember that that person is called a guard, which I couldn't when I told the story on TBTL for some reason, I was calling oh. him like the correctional oh, police you said, person. You, you, no, you said correctional officer. I thought that was totally. Yeah, but I don't even, but guard is just a better word yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah. Like, so I'll tell the story on TBTL and then I'll tell the story on Livewire and it'll get a little better on Livewire because I've kind of like workshopped it on you. Mm-hmm, great. And so like last night when I, I told the story. Thanks I for coming. I, <laughs> just picturing me and you at a party and you've got your Cinco <laughs> mask on and I'm just trying all my stories out on you. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Michelle says... Could you please play K Sera Sera, whatever will be, will be by Sly and the Family Stone sometime? I don't think I even knew I don't that Sly that and the Family Stone do a version of that song. I love the original, which I believe, was it written for, or does it just make an appearance in the movie Vertigo? Oh, the Jimmy Stewart Hitchcock yeah, film? Yeah, isn't it? K Sera Sera is associated with some, some Hitchcock film, isn't it? I, I, I think of it as an oldie. I don't think I know um, what movie it's associated with. Yeah, I'll right. look it up. But anyway, okay. I definitely want to hear the Sly version. Also, here's some important news if you are in Minnesota. The second annual TBTL Duluth. Who loves you, baby? Duluth meetup is happening at Ursa Minor Brewing Saturday, August 24th at 2 p.m. We had a great time last year. The fives and the elevens had fun, too. Tens, not from Minnesota or Wisconsin, should know. That Duluth is a fun place to visit and is cool during the dog days of summer. Hmm. Back to Benny. And, yeah. Uh, by the way, Duluth uh, shows up commonly on lists of places we're all going to have to move to when the oh, climate yeah. is largely uninhabitable. Yeah. Because Duluth has access to fresh water. The temperatures uh, appear to be in a range that is livable. So we're all coming to Duluth eventually. Just Ooh, love uh, you, know baby. that, Michelle. 
who loved you. That's right. Hey, can I take a little victory lap here? Because I am Please do. Uh, so proud of me. I am on Wikipedia right now. It says, K Sarah Sarah, whatever will be, will be, is a song written by the team of Jay Livingston and Ray Evans that was first published in 1955. Doris Day introduced it in the Alfred Hitchcock film The Man Who Knew Too Much, singing it as a cue to their on-screen kidnapped son. So it oh. was debuted in a Hitchcock film. Now, I had the wrong wow. movie. I had the wrong movie, which is fine. That keeps me humble. That keeps me human yeah. and relatable. Uh-huh. But I'm pretty Stay psyched humble, that because of Kendrick. <laughs> people call me the Kendrick Lamar of podcasting and <laughs> hip hop. One um, guy, one time. <laughs> one time, one time. But anyway, yeah. So that is where that is not just it's not just in that movie. That is sort of the origin of that song. Um, if you are going to be anywhere near Duluth on August 24th at 2 p.m., head over to Ursa Minor Brewing for the Duluth hangout and go see yeah. Michelle and everybody else uh, from TBTL land who is going to be there. And Michelle, yeah. thank you for supporting the show and for being a, a good sport about me screwing your name up. <laughs> All those years ago. Maestro? On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody rattle. Oh, you know who's going to be there, Andrew? Mm. Eric Hansen of Golden Valley, Minnesota. Oh, he's got to be. I mean... I don't want to obligate you, Eric, but I'm just figuring you're already in Minnesota. How far is Golden Valley from Duluth? And there's just, I mean, this is June 7th, and the meetup is on August 24th. You have plenty of time to make plans, make arrangements. If you already have or other change plans, your plans, change those plans. Exactly. Eric says, hello, friendos. What is there to say that hasn't been said so far? A uh, call out to the great TENS community. Check. Call out on congratulations to TBTL going independent. Check. Call out to solid content. Check. I'll take that. My goodness. Call out to all the great causes to support. Check. So I guess all that is left to reminisce about one of the best compilation albums of 1980, this objectively perfect moment in time walks the listener through top hits like Let's Go, Refugee, My Sharona, Crazy Little Thing Called Love, and more. Each song is carefully mastered to get out all of the lead singer. He is balanced perfectly with the backing vocals and accompanied by the instrumental wizardry of his trio, bringing each song to another level in cover artistry. It brings chills to me just thinking about it. Time was just different after its release. Time was just different after we all heard Chipmunk Punk. Anyway, be well and keep up the good work. Is this... An album released in 1980 that has the Chipmunks covering all of those songs? I had to look this up. You'll notice there's a link in there. I threw that link in there, and I found something here called uh, Chipmunk chipmunk punk mix that's difficult to say you did a great job luke and it looks like this is just a little sample here this is four songs from the 1980 album chipmunk punk oh we're getting so pulled from spotify that was uh... what song do we think this is i'm trying to place it i definitely know that that is this Refugee? Is this a no. weird version of Refugee? I don't think so. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> oh, it's a... It's a Cars song, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this might... According to YouTube, this, this song Eddie? is called Let's Go, but I don't know who does the song Let's Go. <laughs> the most Friday show we've ever done. <laughs> so is this a, like, is this an officially sanctioned Alvin and the Chipmunks type of thing? Or is this just somebody figured out they could turn their record player up to a different speed? No, I think this is a real songs? thing. Chipmunk punk. I'm looking it up now. I didn't do a lot of research on this. I just found this link. Yeah, look, some people are listening as a 1980 record. Some people are saying 1981. The full album is apparently available online. I could get this on vinyl right here off of Discogs if I wanted to. Um, so, yeah. All right. It's almost too Eric, punky it. for me, though, I feel like. <laughs> Eric, bring... A uh, single of this to the Duluth <laughs> meetup and blow everybody's mind, please. And Eric, thank you so much for supporting TBTL. We could not do this without you. 
All right. Speaking of music, Andrew, mm-hmm. let's um, do a little music for your weekend. But I want to tell you a little bit about my song. Usually we start with you, but would be okay if we if we start with the uh, song that I want to play for you? Oh, fine. I sit with it. Yeah, of course. I have been um, seeing this song pop up on TikTok a lot, and it's written by uh, some tweens in Ireland, and uh, I'm waiting for this uh, New York Times story to load up. Did a group of Irish tweens write the song of the summer? Uh, on a March day, uh, by the way, let's see who wrote this. Uh, Madison Malone Kircher writing in the New York Times about this. Uh, on a March day at the Cabin Studio, an arts nonprofit in Cork, Ireland, Heidi, age 11, and a group of other children were trying to write a rap song with the help of Gary McCarthy, who's a music producer and Cabin Studio's creative director. It was part of a weekly songwriting program. It's a safe space for young people in the community to come create music, hang out, and just make bangers, Mr. McCarthy said. On this day, the group was trying to write an anthem for, and I'm my Gaelic is shite, Andrew. So, Crinu Na Nog, a government sponsored day in Ireland devoted to children's creativity, which is June 15th. Everyone was feeling a little shy and the ideas weren't exactly flowing, Heidi said. Then Gary put on a drum and bass beat and suddenly it was like a switch flipped and everyone started getting involved. She said it was like magic. The infectious beat has also captivated viewers around the world. The group's song, The Spark, has become a sensation on social media, hailed by some on TikTok as an early contender for the song of the summer. Uh, What could have easily sounded grating to adult ears, think Kids Bop, is instead unrelentingly catchy. The song's accompanying music video, which culminates in all of the kids rapping loudly in unison on the top deck of a bus, is utterly charming. Mm. I don't know what your take on this song is going to be, Andrew. I actually have it here, too. I, I've loaded it into my system, so okay. I can just play it for you. Um, I, I don't know if this if you're gonna need this is going to need to grow on you, if you're going to like it immediately. What helped me with the song was I first saw this as a video of these kids at a, like an Irish radio station performing it live. Like, you know how they do those ciphers now? You'll see those pop up on social media where somebody is, like, talking to Sway, the uh, the DJ and, and radio host and kind of hip-hop guy, and then they'll just put a beat down, and then someone will just have to rap over the yeah. beat, you know, kind of freestyle. Mm-hmm. Like, it's sort of that energy. It's like these kids... I mean, these kids aren't freestyling. They're doing their song. But I saw them in this radio studio doing it, like, live, and it was so adorable. And so uh, I kind of was predisposed to like this song. I'm not sure if you're going to love it or not. But just remember, these are Irish tweens. It's also unrelentingly positive, this song called The Spark. So here, let me play a little bit of this for you. Was my there... peen sitting fire to the page? Wait, oh, I thought that was. I thought I heard Mike Pence. I was like, are these kids <laughs> referencing Mike? I'm not no. even joking. I was like, why are they dropping Mike Pence references? Oh, by the way, they have bad takes on January 6th. That's, <laughs> Where were that, they on January? That 6th? is some context that I should have <laughs> yeah, added. To no, the the Irish accent will kind of throw you off, but it mm-hmm. also is to me a huge part of the charm yeah, of this. Definitely. Here, here we go. <laughs> That was, if we see our dream, you know we're going to chase it. <laughs> I love this so much. Get over any fear you have to face it. That's my passion and I couldn't live without it. You can do it like we do it, don't doubt it. Any obstacle, we find a way around it. If you're proud of who you are and what you do, shout it. Think you can stop what we do? I doubt it. We've got the energy, we'll tell you all about it. I searched for my spark. If you, uh, if you and the listeners are not waking up 
with the words, I searched for my spark and I found it <laughs> for the next five days of your life. I don't know what to tell you. It is, to me, very infectious. And um, honestly, I haven't heard anything else that, that I think is more the song of the summer. I mean, the summer is early mm. still. But um, but yeah, so there you go. That's what I wanted to play for you. The spark nice. by... Uh, by these these Irish kids. Nice. I'm glad to know that story, and I love the story. I don't I don't dislike the song. I don't know if I'm quite as taken by it. Mm-hmm. Like it's not like there are certain songs that you that are, that are like very very poppy that um, might seem like it would be outside of what my tastes are. But then I, I I'm really drawn to them. Um, this one maybe is not that. I couldn't see myself. And I'm not trying to poop on it, but uh, like that guy in the bar. Um, yeah. Like I couldn't see Andrew, myself. I just like, hung up a sign that said "No pooping on my Irish kids." Okay? <laughs> no, I I really enjoy that. I'm glad you played that. I don't see myself like playing it like in the car or something. You know what I mean? Like looking to to, yeah. to revisit it. Where it sounds like you would like this is this adds well, some pep to your Well, I have step. been listening to it on my personal time, and yeah. I could see if I was I like having that. like a barbecue. Mm-hmm. Maybe putting it on, but but mostly for people in the know. Like so, last night at Livewire. I was backstage, and uh, by the way, we had Lizzie No on, who is um, a really phenomenal musical performer, and they were recommended to us by a listener. It was a Music for Your Weekend some oh. months ago. Somebody sent in a recommendation of this person, Lizzie No, and I really liked the song, and so then I reached out to our producer, Laura Haddon, and I said, hey, can you track this person down? And uh, they did. And Lizzie No was on the show last night, which was incredible. But anyway, I was playing this song on my phone for somebody backstage, and Lizzie No came out of the dressing area that they were in, and um, like other people, like everybody in the green room who knew about the song was like freaking out, like we were having a real moment. So if I were to play the song at a party, it would just be for other like minded people who are aware of it. Not so much as just a standalone song that I think everyone needs to hear, if that makes like it's sort of a slightly an in joke, I guess. Yeah, no, I definitely know that vibe for sure. Um, I'm tr- the so by the way, it was Dave. I just did a quick little search, it was Dave in New York City who recommended um the Lizzie No song, and it was Annie Oakley. And I can't, I kind of can't remember what it sounds like right now. I'm looking at the music video, um, but I remember liking it. That's the one thing about our listener picks for music for your weekend is we don't react to them because it's the final thing we hear on the show. And sometimes I'm just like, oh, my God, that was such a good song. And I feel like that was one of them. So I'm glad that she got to play uh, play on stage. Yeah, it was good. All. That's cool. Um, what a song would you like to play for the listeners? I was um, surprised and delighted to see that our guy, Old Man Saxon, has oh, a yeah. new song out. I don't know much about where this is going to fit in his discography. I assume that the, because of this new song, I assume that it's going to be on a new album. Um, I don't remember how I stumbled upon this, but um, the album does not seem to be out right now. But the name of the song is Grits. Now, the one thing I like about Old Man Saxon is he is always... Super smooth, super chill, super smooth sound. I will say this is the most sort of a kind of I mean aggressive is too strong of a word, but you'll hear like kind of the 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 um he's playing with somebody here named I want to say Baby Gold. Crouch Cream. I don't yeah. think her name is Baby Gold. I, a performer whose name has um, a baby in the title. Uh, and I really like the vocals, but je- de- the production on this has a bit more of a um, kind of an aggressive feel than most of the Old Man Saxon stuff, but I do like it. At first I heard it, I was like, oh, is this the new face of Old Man Saxon? Um, and now I've listened to it like a hundred times. And I really like it. The name of the song is Grits. <laughs> Focused on a way to get this top down, hostile, baby, what you doing with your wop out? Not now, just enough hours for the task, lockdown, this could all be over with a mask, but I'm mad, tragic, didn't want to ask you, why you got the toolie if you still gonna get your ass kicked, tracking, passive, aggressive with the action, trying to be the greatest, but you didn't want to practice, that's rare, kept another stash of the gears, I'm here, and again, that's the fact of the year, what's next, said you need a stack for respect, say less, tell him shut up, cut the Check, yeah. Ooh, better make moves. What you gon' do? What they said you can't do. See how you feel when they say you ain't shit. Know what that means? Better go get your grits. Get your 
It's like he's. he's Ooh, I like grunting. that. I never hear. Usually he's just kind of like you know. He's very inward looking and like uh-huh. kind of regretful of, of decisions or things he said. This one he's really sort of fronting, but uh, I re- I really do like it. And it's Baby Luck uh, who's on vocals there, by the way, not do, Baby do, 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 do. Baby Luck, do 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 do. Baby, okay. Um, is that another old man Saxon song? It is. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. Um, are you familiar with the song Baby Shark? Oh, is that what that was? Baby shark, do 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 do, baby. Well, there are times where I'm I'm genuine. This is gonna sound like a some sort of a, a mild diss, and I don't mean it to be. I mean it to be a very obvious diss. No, I'm. There are, are sometimes things in pop culture that I'm surprised you've kind of managed to swerve on. I'm not saying Baby Shark is one of them. Like mm-hmm. you probably know, Baby Shark is, but because you do live such a dart based lifestyle, there are sometimes these things like Baby Shark that could kind of miss your radar. Oh, totally. But that. The rest of us are just being pummeled with, and it's always interesting to me the things that have and have not gotten on your radar. Well, but why you were are you aware pummeled of Baby Shark. with Baby Shark as a not as somebody who doesn't have young kids when that was um, so because hot. I just think I dabble in more kind of lowbrow pop culture than you do. So just like people like, referencing it or whatever. Yeah, TikTok-ing or like uh, about again tick TikTokery or like even people I know that have kids or like I don't watch the Today Show per se, but I probably. I have been. I don't know. I I can't exactly say why it is. I think I would have known about Baby Shark when you might not have. But I just think it's because I have worse. I just have lower standards for my pop culture consumption than you do. Well, do you know my my one sort of? And then it might have been the only time I actually heard it. I'd always heard of Baby Shark, but the one time I actually heard it was actually kind of a notable moment for me because it was during the time that I was trying to learn how to rollerblade, and so like ah. I kind of had a standing date with my buddy Nikki. We'd go uh, like rollerblade. In, in these garages below the university um, and the, I was practicing in kind of a couple of different places but I remember there was a Friday afternoon where I got done with work early and I drove somewhere down to South Seattle um, to a roller rink not the cool roller rink that is sort of um, that a lot of adults hang out at, but it was like actually just like a roller rink. And I showed up, I think it was around the, that's right, it was around the holidays. It might have been like between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I showed up at this place in the middle of an afternoon with my roller blades just to practice. And it didn't occur to me until I'm in there how weird this would sort of be because it's, j- I'm the only adult there without kids or any other friends. I'm just this weird, like very awkward on rollerblades guy who shows up while these kids are there. It's nothing but kids in the roller rink. And I'm just like, well, I just want to go in circles and practice. And so I'm rolling around a little bit, just thinking like, this is weird. Like if I were any parents, I'd be keeping an eye on me. Like, what am I doing there? And then I'm not, are you legally required to alert us? As to your presence right. here, because I'm not, I'm not there with friends. You know, it's okay to right. be there without kids, but like I'm just there by myself while kids are having birthday parties and adults, and but no adults are really skating. It's just me and kids. And it's then, daytime too. And it's daytime, and they were playing some pop songs. I remember I even maybe told you about this. I remember they played one pop song that I was like, oh wow, there's a there's a reference in there that would go over kids' heads, but I I knew it was a little bit, um, you know, a little bit, uh, a little. A little on the on the dirty side, and so I was like, "Oh, wow, I'm surprised they're playing this for kids." And then they went from that song into "Baby Shark," uh, and I'm rolling around. And I'm like, "I can't do this anymore." <laughs> <laughs> like, so I immediately got a, got off the rink. I don't know if I ever went back on, or if I just like. I wonder if they played that for the to day. get you out of there to get like to see how I would react. Right? <laughs> like, what if I got really into it? What if I got too into it? That'd be even scarier. But yeah, they start, and I'm like, this is Baby Shark. I got to get out of here. Oh, well, we got to get out of here, yeah, which is do. why we're going to play Michelle's suggestion of Sly and the Family Stone's version of K. Sarah Sarah, famously from the Hitchcock film, exactly. as we all know and love. So that's how we're going to wrap up this broadcast week. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. Thanks for being part of TBTL. We're going to be back here on Monday with more Imaginary Radio for all of you. In the meantime, have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves. Go Mariners. And please remember, no mountain too tall. And good luck to all. When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said.
Power out.